Fist of Timeline Calls George H. Warnock Chapter 13 Timeline Calls The Fist of a Restoration As we have considered the spiritual significance of the glory and the power and wisdom of Solomon's kingdom, so now let us consider the spiritual significance of the days of restoration following the captivity. Both temples and both periods of history are bleak born to our day. Solomon's day is speaking of the glory and the power and wisdom of the church and the days of restoration showing what manner the lost glory is to be restored. As for the day's restoration, it will be of a particular interest and profit to us if we consider carefully the books of Israel, Nehemiah, Haggai and Zechariah, because these four books deal particularly with the return of the remnant to Jerusalem following the captivity, and their attempts to restore the walls and the temple and the order of religious worship. Israel was a priest. Nehemiah was a governor of Jerusalem, and both Haggai and Zechariah were prophets of the Lord we encourage the builders in the great tasks which lay before them. The first phase of the timeline calls after the captivity. The remnant who had returned from Babylon to Jerusalem were determined that all things should be restored according to the original pantheon, and they kept the feast of the Lord also in their due season. They kept also the feast of the timeline calls, at its written, and offered the daily burned offerings and the duty of every day required, Israel, Israel 3, 4. They could not keep the face in the fullness, for the foundation of the horse of the Lord was not yet laid, but they observed the pantheon as best they could, and God honored their faith. And now at the first rays of this glorious face began to appear on the eastern horizon, we have every reason to rejoice, knowing that the days of restoration are here. A little by little, we can see how the pantheon is being unfolded before our eyes. The people assemble as one man. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel was in the cities, the people gathered themselves as one man to Jerusalem, Israel, Three, one. This, of course, is the foundational truth of this whole revival which God has given the church. And one of the first revelations that came forth, that God would now and this time bring the people together to form one body. At the beginning, it was hoped that the Christians everywhere would catch the vision and then before long, the whole body of sins would become one vital living organism united together in the bounds of spirit unto one common purpose. But it is becoming apparent that only a remnant are returning to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. The vast majority are content to remain in Babylon, for they have grew up in that state, and knowing nothing of the glory of God which once rested mightily on the temple gone. They are prosperous enough, and the venture which a few fanatical Israelites have started upon is so utterly hopeless and fantastic that they will have nothing to do with it. Does he imagine a small group of Israelites with no natural resources, for they were a captive people, or were little pampers in the will of full education, or business and administrative ability when turning off to a land they had never seen, to a city utterly wasted and desolate and the studying direct temple comparable to Solomon's. And so the majority, the vast majority, were content to remain in Babylon, with only about the fifty thousand of multitudes, Israel thinking it worth their while to go up and start work on the temple. We know God has great internal purpose 
for His precious sons, and when His plan is revealed, we shall glory in the wisdom of God, who works all things after the counsel of His own will. But it is becoming increasingly evident that the pattern, the remnant, Israel who returned to Jerusalem, is a mere pattern for this hour. It is them. So now a group of people. We are rarely seeing the vision what God is doing, having assembled together as one man. It's the vision of the body of Christ. It's the vision and the assurance that there must arise out of the dust of Jerusalem a holy city, a beautiful city, and a temple now made with hands, a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle. Awake, awake! Put on thy strength, O thy, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Isaiah fifty-two, one two. This whole passage speaks loudly of this day and hour. In which we live, when the glory of God is about to restore to the once holy city of God, even the heavenly Jerusalem, thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together, shall they sing, for they shall they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion, break forth into joy, sing together. Ye wish places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted His people; He has redeemed Jerusalem. Verse eight and nine: the foundation of the temple laid. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaphan, with the cymbals. Symbols to praise the Lord, Israel three ten. The first feast of Tabernacles and the the observed was before the foundation of the temple had been laid, before the real meaning of the feast was lacking. But it did promise great things to come when the days of restoration were over. That was in the first year of the return from captivity. Now. The second year had rolled around, and God has enabled them to lay the foundation for the temple. There was a great rejoicing, therefore, in the camp of Israel to know that God had prospered the work, that the foundation was laid, and that the work was progressing. Hence, there was a cause for great rejoicing. The praise of the musicians. And they sang together by chorus or alternately in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because He is good, for His mercy endures for ever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation, the house of the Lord, was laid. Ezra, three, eleven. It is not without divine purpose or for that the ministry of a spiritual song and music is being restored to the church. Actually, it is a voice of prophecy. We read the four more David than the captains, the host, separate to the service of the sons of Ashva and of Hamam, and of Judithum, who should prophesy with the harps. With the psalm trees, and with the symbols. First Chronicles, First Chronicles twenty-five one. No doubt there was usually prophetic singing accompanied by the music, musical instruments, and together it formed this great prophetic orchestra and choir. And because it is a voice of prophecy, that is why there is a work of deliverance. Wrought when songs are sung in the spirit, and when instruments of music are played in the spirit, David, you recall, 
drove the evil spirit away from Saul, and he played upon the harp. His voice gone, that is a ministry. And it was in the case of the sons of Ashfa, Haman, and Jeduthun. Ashfa means gatherer, Haman means faithful, and Jeduthun means choir of praise. What a wonderful description of what is generally called the heavenly choir. The choir of praise is sung by those who are faithful in their ministry, and together they sing together in the unity of the spirit. It's not difficult then for us to understand why the choir of praise has been restored to the church. The temple service is being restored. The saints are singing by chorus. It is alternately in prophecy one to one another, because once again, the Lord's temple is being restored. Why is the rejoicing? And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid. Is Ram three eleven. The present work of the Holy Spirit in reestablishing the temple ground, it is a spiritual order of worship, and they really just started. But we can thank God, nevertheless, that the pattern has been revealed, and that the foundation has been laid. Remember, it is not too evident to some, because the building is under construction, it is not our purpose to try to prove that the foundation of the apostle and the prophets have been relayed, nor it is really the ministry's responsibility to prove any doctrine to anybody. His duty is to minister bread and light to the hungry. If they can receive it, they will be nourished. If they can't, then perhaps we, we could administer sincere milk, the word that they might grow thereby. According to every man's ability to receive, and the stature in Christ, so may God enable us to minister the word of life. And let us realize that we are sent to feed Christ's sheep and nourish His people, and not to fill them with doctrines and theories which are not profit. They think the word are written only for those who can receive them. And for no others, realize therefore that members are very, very few who can discern the foundation of the temple being relayed in this day. And of course, it is most difficult to see a newly laid foundation, for it is usually almost obscured amidst the concrete forms and the supports, the heaps of broken stones and boards that cover the ground. But the choir praise continues to exhort the Lord, and the saints continue to sing one to another in prophecy, because they can see that the foundation has been laid, and the temple is、uh, beginning to take shape. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but the fellow citizens with the saints. And if the halls are gone, that are built literally are being built upon the foundation of the apostle and prophet Jesus Christ Himself, being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians two nineteen twenty, and God has said some in the church first apostles, First Corinthians twelve twenty eight. The time is at hand when God will vindicate who His ministers are. And where the place is in this new temple, well, this ministry is not by human appointment, not by self appointment, but by divine appointment. Until now, perhaps there has been any great need for recognized leadership. While、well, being in the wilderness, you really do not need a guide until you start traveling through strange territory. But those days are about to end. We stand on the break of Jordan. Before us lie a good land, a great land, a rich heritage in the spirit. But it's a strange territory, and the foes of God is establishing ministries which shall lead the way across Jordan, and the people must be prepared to follow.
And it came to pass, after three days, that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, of Berenic, that ye shall remove from your place and go after it. To Joshua 3, 2 and 3. This is a new way. We have not passed this way heretofore. And with this new way, there shall arise new dangers, new problems, new perplexities. Such a terrible days are ahead as such a deception shall be manifest by the anniversary that the saints must know who God the ministers are that they might follow them into this good land says Paul be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ for the Corinthians 11 1 great opposition we now it would be most enlightening if we could take time to examine in detail the opposition that was raised against the faithful remnant who labored on the second temple. With a clear picture of what is now transpiring and what shall yet transpire and this new temple began to rise into her glory. First there was the opposition of the people who dwell there in the land. The request was, let us build with you, but we seek your God as ye do. Israel 4 and 2. But Zerubbabel discerned their true nature and refused to accept their help. No doubt he was condemned for not cooperating with this noble gesture and this desire for fellowship. But Zerubbabel's action was certainly confirmed in what followed. For immediately he sent letters to the king of Persia, demanding that the builders be forbidden to continue the work. Their argument is quite a modern one. Be known now to the king, that if the city be built and the wall set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt in damage the revenue of the king. Israel. For certain, there are many kings in the church today collecting toil and custom from the temple, from the people, and the restoration of the church is going to bring about their downfall. In the first place, they were never ordained of God. In the second place, instead of shepherding the flock, they were fleecing them. In the third place, when the church is properly established, there will be Local elders in each assembly to guide the flag that there will be no need for the permanently residing pastor. Every minister of God should carefully examine himself in the light of God's controversy with the shepherd Israel and make his calling sure. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye defend, and ye close, you with a wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not of luck. Did this have not yet, ye have not strengthened, neither have ye healed than which was sick, neither have ye bound up than which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sold than which was lost, but with a force, with cruelty have ye ruined them. Ezekiel 34, 2-4. There seem to be very few real, genuine shepherds who are prepared to lay down the life for the ship. It is no wonder, therefore, that the false shepherds do not see the temple God restored and the gates set up. Their revenue shall be damaged when this happens. And so they persuaded the authority in Persia to forbid the progress of the work, and the work ceased. The prophets encouraged the builders. This whole long the work ceased on the temple, we do not know, and this whole long the work on this temple is going to be hindered, we do not know. 
Perhaps God in mercy will do a quick work, nevertheless, despite all the opposition, the, all the obstacles, the work shall continue. Has the Lord not raised the prophets to encourage the builders? This ends he did for Israel. With the builders, we are told, with the prophets of God helping them, encouraging them in their task. Israel, I'm fine too. Is not the purpose of prophecy speaking to men words for edification and extort, exhortation and comfort? First Corinthians 14.3 Edification, building up. It's a work of prophecy to edify and build up the sins and the labor in this holy temple of the Lord. The opposition will continue from within as well as from without. But the prophets of God are there to extort, exhort, and comfort the sins in every hour of a trial. Once again, there were efforts to handle the work, and the mantle referred to Darius, but permission was granted and the work continued. In fact, even other than the timber and the salt, the wine oil, be given the builders to help them in their task. As the build and they prophesied, and they prophesied through the prophesying for Haggai, the prophet, and the cry, the son of Lahadu. It's Ram 6.14. Haggai's prophecy. Haggai's prophecy is most enlightening. In view of all this fact that we are mentioned, for Haggai and Zechariah and with God's special prophets sent to Jerusalem to encourage the builders in the work. His first task was to cause the people to realize that the hour and really come for the house of God to be built. The problem is the same today. These people say the time is now come, the time that the Lord's house should be should he built. But God gave Haggai a simple word of wisdom. It was enough to settle that argument. Isn't, isn't it time for you, or ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lie west. I guy one, two, four. You have your comfortable churches. And of course, that is all right. You have beautiful carvings and tapestry and stained glass windows and beautiful furniture. There's a plenty of time for that, but you have no time for the restoration of God's beautiful house, the temple not made with hands, the temple made of living stones. It is not the fact, the solemn fact, that is the beauty and glory of the Church of Christ that being sacrificed for the natural beauty and refinement of our places of assembly. The people had no objection to this extravagance whatsoever, but as the group of sins declares their intention, restoring the walls of the heavenly Jerusalem and seeking God's face for a restoration of early apostolic power and glory and unity in the congregation of the saints. And there is no time for it. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse 6. And uh, well, might the church Christ consider her ways? You have so much and bring in little. You eat and you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is no warm. And he has the earnest wages, the earnest wages to put it into a bag with holes. Verse 6. It seems almost perplexing and mysterious sometimes when we consider the ways of the church. We read of great revivals, mass healing meetings, of souls getting converted or filled with the Spirit. But when the hour of testing comes, where is all this glory of which we have boasted? How many really come to show evidence of salvation when the revival pass on to the next time? How many retain their healing when they get back home? How many keep filled with the Spirit? When I'm suggesting that this great healing on gospel ministry are not genuine, there will be the force, of course, but God has raised up a mighty ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring healing or salvation to the nations. And much has been 
and his being accomplish and compared to what he has seen the past. But little, really little, compared to what this ministry should produce. We we'll look for much. But then God blow the pie at first in the great fanning mill through which we all must pass. And where is the weight? Does it not seem to have disappeared with the chaff? Why? Says the Lord host. Because of my horse, that is a waste. You run every man onto his own horse. I got one nine. The implication is clear. An indictment against sectarianism is with no uncertain voice. If the body Christ is betrayed for the sake of base skin, or for one's own personal interest in this sect or that, then all our wanted claims to revival and great man's conversions are empty. It is not true that the people assembled together to cooperate in some great mass effort for revival, and after it is all over, they run every man onto his own horse. Back they go to the little sect at a time to build it up with the new commerce brought to birth by the revival effort. And God blows upon the work by his shifting, testing, trying spirit, and lo, it came to little. And the drought, the lack of spiritual power and blessing, the absence of any real fellowship with the sins or unity of the spirit, and the reason there is no latter rain. God has called the drought, and therefore in his word, the heavens, I was a hold them their due. Through the bell faces the challenge. Zerubbabel, who was in charge of building the second temple, and Joshua, who was the high priest, and the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of God that spoken by the prophet. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord hosts. Haggai 1.14 We have already considered in some detail the story of their labors and their problems. But God was with them. Zerubbabel means a psalm in Babylon, and Joshua is the Hebrew for Jesus. It's not true that we have all been planted in Babylon, that great city, the city for all manners of abominations, religious and otherwise. But some have heard the call, Come out of her, my people, and have been transplanted into another land. In the land of the true calling, ye lad come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to a innumerable company of angels, to the great assembly and church of the first form, which are written in heaven. Hebrew twelve twenty two twenty three. Haggai prophesies it. On the last day of the feast, it has been assumed that Haggai was probably born on the feast day because his name signifies feast of Jehovah. However, an amazing passage of scripture in his prophecy reveals that Haggai gave entrance to one of the church's choice promises on the last day of the feast of Tabernacles. Therefore, he was truly named Haggai, which signifies feast of the Lord. One might wonder why the scriptures go into such detail and times in giving us dates and seasons which seem to be meaningless to us. God, no doubt, has a great plan in it all, and as our eyes become enlightened to the riches of his word, many delightful surprises are there to greet us. As so we read, in the seventh month, in the one of the twentieth day of the month, Came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Haggai to him, the seventh month and twenty-first day of the month, in other words, in the last day of the feast of Tabernacles. Does he imagine what concern and heartache must have a grip of the holy prophet the Lord and look upon, look down upon the second temple, 
slowly rising from the dust, but so very, very incomplete and far from being glorious temple. And now on this great day, the last day of the feast. When the memory of every true Israelite would naturally revert back to the days of Israel's glory and the power in the days of Solomon's magnificent kingdom, a guy would likewise be thanking the great and tremendous heritage which they had lost because of captivity. The magnificence of Solomon's temple was utterly insurpassable. There's nothing in the annals of history. To compare with it, past or present, or present, how could this feeble remnant begin to erect a structure even comparable to that wonderful temple? How discouraging the work must have been, and they contemplate the glory they had lost. And then, were a moment on the last day of the feast of Tabernacles, the word of prophecy came upon him. He cried to Zerubbabel. And the remnant, who is left among you, that saw the souls in her first glory, and how do you see it now? Is now in your eyes, in comparison of it, as nothing? You now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest, and be strong, O ye people of the land. Says the Lord, and work, for I am with you. Says the Lord hosts, according to the word that I commanded with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Fear ye not, for thus says the Lord hosts. Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. A desire for all nations shall come, and will fill the halls with glory," says the Lord Host. "The silver is mine, the gold is mine," says the Lord Host. "The glory of this land of halls shall be greater than the former," says the Lord Host. "And in this place will I give peace," says the Lord Host. Haggai three, two Haggai two, three to nine. Notice. The repetition of the phrase says, "The Lord hosts." God wants us. God wants us to make no mistake about this. God has spoken, and now men, true, our feeble attempts and restoration are nothing compared to the glory of the early church, the temple of the living God, erected in past days. But God has promised. The glory of this land of halls shall be greater than the former. Neither the rebuilt temple, nor the temple Herod, could begin to compare with Solomon's temple. The God was not speaking of the earthly halls; he was speaking of the temple, not made with hands, composed of living stones. And the desire of all nations would he. The glory of that temple would be the glory of that temple, and so Malachi prophesies, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to His temple. Malachi three one, all nations, ye the creation itself, are waiting eagerly for His appearing, even for the manifestation of the sons of God. Romans eight nineteen. No shall their hopes and expectations be disappointed, and how shall this exceeding glory be manifested by the very shaking of the heavens and the earth? Paul quotes this passage in Hebrew twelve twenty six and assures us that this shall be fulfilled in the kingdom of the saints. Without some want, with the shaking of the heavens in the previous chapter. The very unseen powers, the heavenlies, must be toppled down from their thrones. Ye, even now, as they begin to feel the impact of heavenly tremor, tremors, and the sun's gun begin to mount up with the wings of eagle, to take unto themselves their gun-given authority in the spirit, 
Bishwam, Bishwam, Bishwam. E, the threefold prophecy of comfort and encouragement to the builders of the temple, to the priesthood and to the remnant. For it is in the spoken word of prophecy that power and the strength shall be imparted to the builders, enable them to use the tools of their ministry in the one hand and to fight with the sword of the Spirit in the other. With similar words of encouragement and with a similar purpose in mind, the Apostle Paul extorts the sense, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor gone, that ye may be able to stand against the wild of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers, the dark, the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians six, ten to twelve, isn't. It is a surrendering with the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenlies that it shall cause the world heavens to shake and sitting as a host to relinquish the kingdom into the hands of the sons of God. Everything that can be shaken is going to quake and fall before the sons of God. At the end to the world heavenly shall they ascend first of all in the spirit to take possession of the kingdom left vacant by the casting out of Satan and his evil hosts. Then shall they be in the position to administer peace and life and blessing to a church and a world that are in bondage and under oppression. The cry is a prophecy. This is the cry for the cry likewise prophesied. Words encouragement to Zerubbabel and the remnant who labored on the temple. In what way would the Lord encourage the builders in the colossal task that lay before them? Well, the Lord would give the prophet a vision that would explain the means of their success. How helpless they were. How would the Lord encourage them? And so Zechariah looked, and what did he see? Mountains of stone and timber and mortar. Huge labor and battlings marching down from Babylon to help them. Great mission to aid in their seemingly impossible task. Oh no. But I looked and behold, a candlestick all of gold was a ball upon the top of it and is the seven lamps thereon and two olive trees about it. A very simple illustration and the minimalist pampers to many. Two olive trees pouring their oil into a candlestick. The cry himself did not know what it meant, so God gave him the interpretation. This is the word of the Lord unto the rebel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What art thou, O great mountain? Before the river bow, thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Shall anything be too hard for the Lord? By my spirit, says the Lord, and so shall it be. And now let us notice this great word of encouragement, which God speaks even now to the builders of this living temple. The hands of the bell have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord host has sent me unto you, for who has despised the day of a small things, child of God. Remember, his words, God has pledged his word that this temple shall be finished. Let us never lose that vision. But still the cry was puzzled. What were these two hollow trees? And he saw him ting their golden oil into the candlestick. And the angel replied, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Literally, these are the two sons of oil. Sons of the anointed. It is the most elastic company. As we shall discover in the next chapter, 
is a company of overcomers, who shall go forth in the day of the Lord, working all manner of signs, the wonders and miracles in the name of the Lord, and nothing shall stand against them by my spirit, says the Lord. Is the work of a spirit gone? The oil of the spirit flowing through them. That's the secret of the power. Restoration of the walls. The books is run the Himalayan cover two periods of restoration. That is run the Nephi were present the rebuilding the temple, but it came many years later. It's run to teach the people the law of God and the Nehemiah to rebuild the walls and the gates of the city. So we read that all that it could hear with understanding assembled together as one man into the street that were before the water gate, while Israel and the priest read from the law of God from morning till midday. This was the first day of the seventh month, the month of the feast of Tabernacles, say Nehemiah 8, 1 to 3. So the read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Nehemiah 8, 8. This is the hour of revelation and the spiritual understanding. The Spirit is speaking to the churches, but only those with the ear to hear shall understand what is spoken. The natural man received now the things of the Spirit of God, and any man whose mind have been quickened by the Spirit shall be able to give the sense on the one hand or understand the reading on the other. He that has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The people in their place. And the people stood in their place. Nehemiah 8, 7. God is setting his ministries in the body, in the body, according as it pleases him. And the times come when every man must know his place in the body and serve the Lord accordingly. Ministries have been raised out for the express purpose of ministering gifts of the Spirit through prophecy and the laying on of hands and the sins are extorted to war a good warfare accordingly. First Timothy 1.18 Realize, of course, that much harm has been done by those who are attempting to administer gifts to others through prophecy and the laying of hands. God has not authorized them to engage in this ministry. But the tares must always grow together with the wheat until the time of harvest. If the child of God is walking in close communion with the Lord, then the Spirit will witness and to the truth of the prophecy which go forth, goes forth concerning him. And if he is not walking in close communion with God, then the prophecy will mean nothing to him anyway except members to harden his heart or fill him with a pride. This will, I sir, as a good test. The pride rises up in the heart. The prophecy, whether true or false, cannot be relied upon. For even true prophecy must submit to the test of faith and obedience in one's life and ministry. Furthermore, the purpose of prophecy is to establish, edify, comfort, and extort and if the candidates are left in a state of confusion or turmoil and doubt, he must as well reject what has been said concerning him, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14.33 We merely mention these things because we know that many are trying to engage in this ministry of prophecy with the laying of hands, and God has never commissioned them to do so. The ministry is real and genuine, and all can testify who have really entered into the reality of this move of the Spirit. But as surely and the sword plans good to see the enemy there to sow tires, and both tares and both must grow together until the harvest. However, if the child of God who hungers to know God's will and do it has not had the opportunity for being set aside, by prophecy, and the laying of hands. He need not be in the least discouraged. Let him continue the things which God has placed in his hand to do. True is a humble and lowly position, and you cannot go on, pray, fast, intercede, show mercy, give, help, and assist God's people 
do whatever the Lord enables you to do, enables you to do in humility and meekness. And God will honor your efforts. And regardless of any prophecy that has been given to any man, unto consecration unto God is God's will for you, first and foremost. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but ye, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove, prove what is then good but acceptable and the perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. That is the will of God for you. Take the lowly position, therefore, and God will exhort you in due course when you are able to receive it. Much better than you should be found doing some humble task as the Lord promote you unto honor than that he should be forced to say, Give this man place. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest, lowest room. Luke 14, 9. If this plan is followed, God will certainly give guidance and direction. And in his own good time, when he chooses to reveal your ministry in greater fullness through prophecy and the laying of the hands, his servants will be directed your way and led of the Spirit set you apart unto the work for which God has called you. Send portions to the needy. Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. Nehemiah 8, 10 As the feast tabernacle begins to down upon us, it's becoming increasingly important that the saints send that as something to minister to their fellow members in the body. They must not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord. Deuteronomy 16, 6, 16, 17. This strongly reminds us of Paul's exhortations to the Romans and Corinthians concerning their ministry in the body of Christ. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portions of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, Romans 12, 6 and 7. The whole ministry of the various members to edify the body, and not for their own gratification, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. As good stewards, the manifold grace of God, First Peter 4, 10. As a minister develops, and he minist his ministry develops and bodies edified, then they will go forth unto the world, bring health and gladness to those who sit in darkness, starvation, and the shadow of death, victory, and the prosperity ahead. Go forth unto the mound, and fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees to make booths, and it's written, No doubt, all the trees are significant of one thing and another, but broadly speaking, they depict the victory and the prosperity of joy, and triumph for the people of God. The olive is a true symbol of the Holy Spirit. The olive oil was used for making the holy ointment for the anointing of prophets, priests, or king. Palm branches, you will recall, were cut down and scattered in the path with the king who came riding triumphantly into Jerusalem, sitting upon the ass, amidst the shouting of the people and of the children. Hosanna, they cried, Bless is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Mark 11.9 And the sons who come out to the great tribulation, clothed in white robes, have palms in their hands, and they shout the victory psalm and worship the Lamb that was slain for them. There is a great deal of gladness ahead. For the sins when the face of the tabernacle is observed. 
but they must leave their homes in the streets of Jerusalem. They must forsake their own ways, their own thoughts, their own plans and desires, and crucify the flesh in order that the light Christ and the joy of the Holy Ghost might be their portion. What the spectacle this sin must have on presented, thousands upon thousands of little humble tabernacles or booths erected along the streets of Jerusalem or upon the housetops or in the courts of the temple, or in the open places of the city, all assembled together with one common purpose in mind, with one heart and one soul to keep the face of the Lord. The booth was nothing much to behold, just the humble, fragile heart, says Paul, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of a God and not of us. Second Corinthians 4, 7. We mouth the translation of this passage is the most expressive, but we have this treasure in fragile earthen pots, in order that the surpassing greatness of power may be seen to be gone and not to come up from us. Again, Paul says most gladly, therefore will I rather glory my infirmities, that the power of Christ may be rest may rest upon me. Second Corinthians twelve nine literally reads that the power of Christ me spread a tabernacle over me. It's a manifestation of Christ within us. It's a crucifixion. It's a crucifixion. It's a crucifixion of our flesh that the word life Christ might, might be revealed in the power of the Holy Ghost. Opposition within and without. He might give a further light on the opposition. There was a raid against them. At the start of the tremendous task, there was nothing more than mockery. One said, even that which is built, if a force go up, it shall even break down the stone wall. In my four three, but soon the mockery turned to violence. They realized that great progress was being made in spite of their tremendous difficulties. And so they began to get fearful and try to handle the work by force of arms. It became necessary therefore for the builders to be armed with spears as well as tools, and to build it with a sword girded by the sides. In my four eighteen. If we seek to restore the walls of Jerusalem, we're going to find it necessary in the very near future to put on the whole armor of a gun. Mockery is giving way to violence. Satan will soon begin to use a force against the sense instead of being sought because he realizes that the plan of God is being fulfilled even if the work is slow and not any too spectacular. Then carnality creeps into the midst of God's people and brother was ill-treating brother because of hard times some were being forced to mortgage their frails and their properties and the rich were exacting usury from the poor and we can be sure of this, since that one of Satan's sure devices against God's people is in causing internal strife and division. If he cannot conquer by outward tank, he is often most successful by causing the congregation to fall into sin. When Balaam could not curse Israel, for they were God's people, and God turned the curse into a blessing, then he advised Balak to invite the people to great sacrifice their gods, and Israel fell into the tramp. Consequently, a great plague swept through the whole congregation. Numbers 25, 1, 2, and 31, 16. Finally, some blood conceived another plot against Nehemiah, perhaps the most subtle foe. If he was unable to conquer by force or by mockery, he would befriend Nehemiah and in that way betray him. He would propose a conference. Come! Let us meet together, he suggested, but Nehemiah discerned the true intent and the purpose of the proposed meeting, and replied that he was too busy. Nehemiah 6, 2 to 8, feeling that he hired a man to come, to persuade Nehemiah to flee into the temple for safety, stating that his son were after his life. But Nehemiah had no part in the priesthood, and refused to sin against God in this manner. And again, the plan to field. Nehemiah's ministry was to govern the land, not to minister in the temple. Pamper Sidon's most successful form of attack against the sins to get them to become involved in some work the Lord which is not there to perform. 
appear to be such an innocent, innocent thing, a perverse need that arises would almost demand that you submit and take upon yourself some ministry which God has neither enabled you nor called you to perform. But God knows all about it. It is some who are qualified to meet that need. Let, us, let every man minister according to the ability which God gives in the place which God has a destiny for him. Every man has his job to perform. No man needs to be unduly concerned about his ministry if he will, but the minister according to the ability and the power which God has given. For the ministry that you have is one that is suited to you, a one for which God has gifted you. If you are walking with God, you will automatically be in your ministry. And the ministry that you have from God has constituted you a steward or literally a horse manager of his affairs. Having received a gift from God, therefore, we are called upon to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And as a steward of God's horse, only one thing is required of you, and that is faithfulness. First Corinthians 4.1 you are not called upon to be great, or mighty, or prosperous, or clever, or successful, or do great things, but to be faithful. Before God, that is true greatness and true success. Before God, that is the true greatness and true success. The lone soldier, got in some obscure, wide or spot in the field of battle, even if he never sees an action, is as much entitled to promotion and the man in the front lines. One thing sure, the day of Christ is going to reveal every man's faithfulness in building up the one foundation, which is Jesus Christ. That we know the judgment seat of Christ will reveal quality and not quantity. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort of it is. First Corinthians three thirteen. It is a good, silver, precious stone, you will stand the test. If it is wood, hay, stubble, it will be burned up, leaving the builder without the crown glory, saved and through fire. And so worry uh, and so every Israelite had his job to perform. Some on the ship gay, some on the fish gay, some on the tower. Another on that tower, some on this tower, and another on that tower. Some at the fountain, some at the pool, some at the stairs, some at the armory, some at the horses of the praise. But they all work together according to their several ability. The prophets of God encouraging them, and they build, and they build, and they build. In due course, the wall was finished, a defense of the city was made secure.